Good afternoon. Welcome back to the class. We are now at Matthew chapter 15. When we last stopped in chapter 14, we studied the death of John the Baptist and Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then Jesus walking on the water. And when we ended that chapter, in the last verse, even uh, from verse 35, if I may, and when the men of that place recognized him, Jesus, they sent out into all that re surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touch it, it were made perfectly well and as many as touch it were made perfectly well so i wanted to show you this picture which i had uh, uh, kept it in uh, added to the powerpoint but forgot to mention it last week you see it on the screen that is at the back of the boy this is the these are the blue tassels and of course for the rabbi uh, they would have worn something larger, something more auspicious, more conspicuous, I mean, uh, that others might see how religious they are. So now, we are at chapter 15. And in chapter 15, we are still in this uh, section where Jesus retreated because the people, uh, uh, he, he had opposition from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So in chapter 15, if I may, uh, there are three main sections here. Uh, what defiles a man? And then in the second part of this would be the ministry, his ministry among the Gentiles. And we'll finish this chapter with Jesus feeding the 4,000. So Father, we just come to you and we ask of you to open our hearts to the ministry of your word that you will speak to us even through your written word, that we can find application even in our daily walk with you. So speak to us and teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, um, on the screen, um, the slide has an outline of five points, which we will go through. Uh, but I, I prefer the one where it is... What defiles a man from verse 1 to verse 20. And then the ministry among Gentiles from 21 to 31. And finally, Jesus feeding the 4,000 from verse 32 to verse 39. Uh, it's not on your screen, but uh, in essence, uh, it is similar uh, to what I have. Now, let's look at verse 1. Now, in this first section, what Jesus was trying to address was this human tradition. This power of tradition, the tradition of the elders, the tradition of this so-called holy man in Israel upon the people and how he admonished them uh, for this tradition. And finally, he will explain to the disciples so that they have a better understanding of what goes in and what comes out and what will defile a man. So, let's look at verse 1. And as we do so, you will notice that Jesus is addressing this, the outward form versus the inward faith. So, the, of course, the inward attitude is more important and critical than the outward actions as displayed by all these Pharisees. Verse 1, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. I'm sure by now you are quite familiar uh, with scribes. Scribes are those who uh, who expound the word. Um, they, they will copy the word, the scripture. So they are 
very familiar with the scriptures. Then you have the Pharisees. The Pharisees are those uh, in the original meaning. It means the separated ones. They pride themselves as being uh, of an elitist. They are separated from the ordinary people because they are so holy and so pious and so religious and so legalistic. And those were the Pharisees. Um, very conservative. But on the other end, you have the Sadducees. Uh, these are the more liberals. Um, they, they are also in the social elite class and they lean towards the political side. So we have this too, as mentioned here in verse 1. The scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem and they came to Jesus. Now if we look at the map, if we look at the map um, last week, if you remember, Jesus, after he finished his ministry, uh, and then um, he, in verse 34 of chapter 14, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret. So where were they? They were in Bethsaida. So after the ministry there, they crossed and they went across the sea and they went now to Genesaret. So, this is where Jesus was when we ended chapter 14. And then as we come to chapter 15, we have scribes and Pharisees uh, who were from Jerusalem coming to Jesus. So they have come up from the south here in Jerusalem and they have gone all the way up here north, the west of the Sea of Galilee. And what were they, why were they looking for Jesus? And even as they made this 7-mile journey, 70-mile journey, um, it is not to, to uh, commend Jesus, but to trap Jesus. They are still looking for something to trap him so that they can arrest him. So, um, in Jesus' case, Jesus need not look for trouble. Trouble was looking for him. And so these people were there. And they said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Now, in the Pentateuch or the Torah, um, it, it is very clearly stated about cleanliness, about hygiene, about washing uh, your hands even before you have your meal. And the uh, Orthodox Jews do take a lot of effort and pay a lot of attention even to the washing, it is quite ceremonial uh, how they wash their hands even before a meal uh, for hygiene reasons. So even as they put out their hands uh, uh, with the palms uh, facing upwards and water will be poured down. And even as this water from cleansed sanctified vessels are poured down into their head and this will drip and flow down to the end of the elbow and then they invert their arms and now it's pointing down and the water is poured again from the upper side of the elbow and then it's poured back down and it flows down all the way to the fingertips and it drops off now and then they need to really uh, clean and wipe and dry their hands now their hands are clean and they are fit for food consumption. I can only think of uh, the, the procedures that right now we have to wash our hands for so 20 minutes or no, uh, 20 seconds, uh, even uh, in the light of this COVID-19. So that was for hygiene reason. <coughs> but not so for these scribes and Pharisees when they came to Jesus, uh, hygiene wasn't exactly on their mind. To them, by not washing, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread, there wasn't a hint of hygiene. It was because they have transgressed the tradition of the elders. They have not adhered, they have not followed the instructions of the elders of Israel who have given uh, commands about cleanliness and how to wash and so on and so by not 
doing that, it was an excuse for them to rebuke or challenge Jesus and his disciples. Now, before we go there, um, perhaps it is good to know what exactly is the tradition of the elders. So let's see. I have it here. Now, looking at the looking at the uh, holy books of Judaism is on your screen. Now, in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, what we now know as the Old Testament, it is known as the Takanath. If I I'm not sure if I pronounced correctly. It's T-A-N-A-K-H. And in this Taknaka, um, it comprises three items. Number one is the Torah. Number two is the Nivim. The third one is Ketuvim. Now, the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, or we also know it as a Pentateuch. So from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers to Deuteronomy, these are the first five books. And these are the written law, written law, written word of God. Pentateuch, as written by Moses. We all know that. Then the Nevi'im are the books of the prophets. And we have been studying the prophets uh, in the last few years. Yeah, Isaiah, Daniel, and, and, and the like. The writings of the prophets. Then Ketuvim, the rest, the remaining writings, uh, you know, like, like the Psalms and the Proverbs and all this, these are the remaining, this, they come under the Ketuvim. Now, these are the written law of God. Then there is also something called the oral law. Oral because it has been passed on by word of mouth. It has been passed on to the people of Israel from the elders. And they wanted to interpret the scriptures as what we had in the Tanaka, the, the, the Torah, and the Nevim and Ketuvim, but more so in the Torah. They wanted to interpret to make it relevant uh, for the people as they go about their daily living. So, the oral law as passed on from by word of mouth from the elders of the community, Jewish community, that is the Talmud. T-A-L-M-U-D. The Talmud. And then, in the Talmud also includes this called the Mishnah. Now, what is the Mishnah? Mishnah is uh, interpretation of the Holy Scriptures. So, if you may use the word expounding, like explaining and so on. But even as they did all this, as they did all this, they added a lot more, a lot more uh, instructions. They make it so burdensome and onerous upon the people of Israel. And so, when we just read, when these scribes and Pharisees approached Jesus and said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They were not referring to the word of God. They were not referring to that which came from God and that is found in the Tanaka or specifically from the Torah, the first part. No, they were referring to the second part. This under the Talmud, which were the interpretation and the exposition and the addition by the elders of the Jewish community, their, their understanding and their interpretation of the scripture. And so why do your disciples transgress? Not the word of God, again I say, but the tradition of the elders. So it seems like the tradition of the elders has got a higher importance higher priority prevails over the word of God. For they do not wash their hands when they eat. So we look at Mark chapter 7, 
verse 3. Mark chapter 7, verse 3. Mark wrote, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, which I sort of explained it to you just a few minutes ago, pour the way the water is poured, holding the tradition of the elders. Again, it is the elders, not the word of God. Now, this ceremonial cleansing has a problem. It is an outward action, but what about the inward attitude? So we read in verse 3, He answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? I know Jesus is a wonderful communicator, and in this instance, he answered a question with a question. Since you ask me, let me ask you. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? So now, Jesus wanted to put them in the right perspective. Let's get this right. Which is more important? Which has got higher priority? Because your power of tradition is nothing but empty religion. So Jesus was admonishing them on the way they imposed tradition on the people. These, these are very vain and meaningless rituals. And in short, if we can describe this in one word, it is called religiosity. And so in verse 4, Jesus said clearly, stated, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. Surely, this is not unknown to the scribes and the Pharisees. They know the scriptures. And they know this is in the word of God. This is in the Torah. It is the fifth commandment. You will find this in Exodus chapter 20, where the ten commandments are listed, given to them. And they were commanded to honor their father and their mother. And not only in words, but in thoughts and also in action, to honour their parents in thoughts, in speech and in action. But he who does not, then let him be put to death, even him who curses his parents and, 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 and dishonour them. But you say, that means addressing the scribes and the Pharisees now, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever prophet you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and his mother. But you say, verse 5, verse 5 and verse 6, this is not from the Torah. This is not from the written law. This is not from God. This is what the elders had introduced, added. Now, we read a bit more uh, detail as we look into Mark chapter 7 verse 11. Now you will find we will be making cross reference uh, with uh, Mark chapter 7 where we will find a, a bit more detail, a bit more details than, than what we have here. Why? Because Matthew wrote this book to the Jews. And these are basic things, fundamental things to the Jews. They, they understand, even if uh, Matthew omit a few things here and there. But Mark, Mark wrote that his book to the Romans. And the Romans are not familiar with the Jewish culture nor history. So he explained it, expanded a bit in his writing. And that is also for our benefit. So Mark chapter 7, verse 11, in the same event, same event, uh, but you say, if a man says to his father and mo or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is, is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother. So Mark 
introduced the word Korban to the Romans. Like us, Gentiles, we don't know. But the Jews will know what is Korban. Now, what is that? So, if I have uh, my parents coming to me and they are in need of some financial assistance and, and some help in their old age, maybe I could give them $10 so they can buy lunch. But I would say, uh, Dad, Mom, I'm so sorry because everything in this house, every cent, every ornament, every piece of jewelry and, and anything that is worth of any value, I've dedicated all of them unto the Lord. So they are to be used for God. I cannot even offer you this $10 which I have already dedicated to God for you. So I can't help you. So they are all under this koban. And they've all been dedicated to God. So they use that excuse to get away from the responsibility of honouring their parents. And in most instances, these people did not use the money for God, but whatever that they, they have excused themselves from, they use this for themselves. So that's what Jesus was saying. But you say what whoever says to his father or mother, back to Matthew chapter 15, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. I've already vowed that to God. So I can't give it to you. Then he need not honor his father or mother. And Jesus said to them, Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. You have transgressed. You have transgressed the word of God. That's what they have done. They have allowed tradition to prevail, to prevail above the law. And so Jesus called them hypocrites. Hypocrites. And if you study in the gospel, you can count. Jesus used the word hypocrites up on, on these scribes and Pharisees on at least 22 occasions. And he was really calling a spade a spade. As I've explained before, a uh, hypocrite is in, in a Greek, it is a play actor, someone who is just performing. So these scribes and Pharisees were playing religion and they were living behind they were hiding and leading a life of falsehood behind a mask not the face mask we are wearing now but the it's just a mask that they're hiding they're deceiving people hypocrites so before we move on to verse 7 and the, the rest verse 8 i would just like to say that you know the hypocrites they like to preach by the yard, I mean, referring to the Pharisees and the scribes, um, these hypocrites, they like to preach by the yard, but their action are by the inch, and so Jesus uh, treated them by the foot. If you can catch that. They preach by the yard, they acted by the inch, so Jesus treated them by the foot. F-O-O-T. So, back to verse 7. Hypocrites, why? well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, so Jesus quoted from Isaiah, no, from Psalm uh, 78 verse 36, Psalm 78 verse 36, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. Wow, they sound so pious. They sound so holy. And even as they draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but, and Jesus got three accusations of them, but, number one, their heart is far from me. And in vain, they worship me. So, first, their hearts were far from Jesus. Secondly, their worship was empty. Empty worship. And thirdly, teaching as doctrines the commandments of God. So they were teaching man's doctrine. They were teaching the, the, the commandments of men and, and imposing, insisting this as the doctrines of God. So they're replacing the doctrine of God with the commandments of men. So wrong teaching. So 
their hearts are far from God, from Jesus. Uh, they, they have empty worship. And then they teach the wrong thing. Replacing the word of God with the commandments of men. So as we look at this, the heart of the matter is actually the matter of the heart. I mean, the heart of this whole issue about tradition and, 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 and the word of God and so on, at the end, it, at the end of the day, the heart of this matter, that means the centrality of this matter, is actually the matter of the heart. Get the heart right and everything will be right. Because if you remember, Jeremiah said in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So this, I'm, I'm sure we are very familiar with this. And in verse 10, God said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And before we move on to verse 10, I just want to show you one more verse, Psalm 119, verse 11. And this, we ought to bear this in mind, bear this in our heart. Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. So, it is very evident the word of God was not hidden in the hearts of these scribes and Pharisees. But we do not emulate them. We ought to hide his word in our heart so that we will not sin against our Lord Jesus. So, we now come to verse 10. And this, when Jesus called, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, so he called the multitudes to him and then he said to them, what was he saying? He was telling them about the Pharisees. He was going to teach them and instruct them and enlighten them. So he said, hear and understand. The problem is many times we just hear, but there is no understanding. So Jesus, the teacher, is also teaching us now. Even as you hear, you must understand. If you don't understand, you must ask. And we will find this in verse 15 shortly. Who else would ask that question except Peter? But we will come to that in verse 15. So, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man. But what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. I'm sure you have heard this. You have heard this many, many times. So not what goes into your mouth defiles a man. So this is physical. One can think of food. Oh, if you don't wash your hands and then the, you eat, the, the food is unclean or filth will get in and it can defile you. But Jesus was talking about something spiritual. So not what goes into your mouth defiles a man. But what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. So, moral defilement is key, it's important, it's essential, it's critical. Not the physical defilement. If we look at Mark chapter 17, no, Mark 7 verse 19. Mark 7 again, verse 19. Let me read from verse 18. So he said to them in Mark chapter 17, Are you thus without understanding also? Do not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. You know what this means? So whatever that comes in from the outside, and it is consumed. It does not enter the heart, but his stomach. And it's elimin eliminated. What is eliminated? These are the ways. 
but the good and nutrient the good the nutrients the, the 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 necessary for the upkeep of our body those will be kept but the waste will be eliminated thus purifying all food so back to matthew chapter 15 verse still on verse 11 so what jesus was saying is but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. So what comes out? Where does it come? It comes from out of the mouth, but it comes, its source, its original this, uh, location was the heart. So what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. And you know, this verse 11 is a parable that the people did not understand. Peter did not understand. That's why he asked for clarification shortly in a while. And you will find that Jesus is emphasizing the inner attitude is more important than the outward action. So, verse 12, I will elaborate when, when Jesus uh, uh, speaks in verse 16. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? What do you think Jesus will answer? Oh, I didn't know. No, of course Jesus knew. He meant to offend them. Because they were so contented in their own religiosity. They taught the world of themselves. And Jesus here was to stir them and to offend them. So, by this, their relationship, if there was one at all, uh, came to a breaking point. And so the, the Pharisees after this were definitely against Jesus and they would do their very best to eliminate him. So, verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. You, you know, Israel uh, is also symbolized by a tree, a fig tree, you know. So, here it is, you, you have to think of, you know, a nation uh, 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 like Israel, every plant. So, every nation which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. But in this case, in this context, the application is a religious system. So, again, specifically pointing to the Pharisees. So, every religious system, if I may just amplify for you, every religious system which my Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. And when you uproot a plant, that means it is over, game over, it is going to wither, it's going to die. So, we look around the world today, we see there are cults, there are cults, there are false religions, false teaching, and so many other things. Well, fear not. Because my Lord Jesus said, every plant, every religious system which my Heavenly Father has not planted, and I underline this word in my Bible, will. That means definitely. It is not maybe it will eventually be uprooted, be eliminated. They are all destined for judgment. And in this case, the Pharisees will be uprooted. Verse 14, let them alone. Let them alone. Does it ring a bell somewhere? Because if you remember, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, when we studied the parables of the wheat and the tares, and during the night, uh, the enemy came and planted tares among the wheat. So the servant came to the master and said, Do you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Yeah? And the servant wanted to go and uproot the tares. But in verse 30 of chapter 13, Jesus said, Let them let both no let both grow together until the harvest and at the time of harvest i will say to the reapers first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn 
So it is the consistency of scripture, the consistency of Jesus, even as he said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. Here he said again, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. So this people are so well described by Paul and he described this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 and it is also happening today these people have a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away so we need we need to know the word and know the truth and to avoid such people who only have a form of godliness, but they got no substance. They deny the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we should stay away from such. And such were the Pharisees. So, we come to now verse 15. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. Which parable is this? This parable is verse 11, which we just read. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. It is a parable, though it is only one verse. Jesus was using something earthly to teach a heavenly principle. So, one thing we learn here in verse 15 is, when in doubt, ask. When unclear, ask. And ask who? Ask Jesus. Ask Jesus. And he answered in verse 16. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So, finally, by the time Jesus got to say this in verse 20, he answered the question in verse 2, Why do your disciples transgress? For they do not wash the hands, their hands when they eat bread. Let's look at verse 16 again. Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? These disciples have been with Jesus at least two years. They've been following him. They have been watching him. They, they listen to his teaching. They have seen the miracles and so on. Again, they could have heard but did not understand. They could have seen but did not understand. So it is not just the word, but it is also the heart. So the word and the heart, they must come together. So, we have read many times, um, verse 18, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Now, I'm going to ask you now, where is the heart? Where is the heart? Now, most people will quickly point, uh, put their right arm across their chest to the left, uh, breast area and say this is where the heart is true true but do you know when jesus and the bible say refer to the heart is not referring to this organ do you know which organ it is referring to it is definitely not the one on the left side of your chest let's read again okay but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. Verse 19. Okay. So, 
Verse 18, come out from the heart, they defile a man. So somebody said this so well. Um, what is in the well of the heart will come out in the bucket of the mouth sooner or later. What is in the well of the heart means well inside your heart will come out through the bucket of your mouth sooner or later. So you think, oh, okay, heart. Okay, it is definitely the heart, but not this organ. I will show to you shortly. And they defile a man. So we come to verse 19. And there is a hint here. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. So out of the heart, there will be schemes. There will be evil thoughts. Uh, there will be evil motives. But does your heart, the physical heart on the left side of your breast, is it, is it a thinking organ? Is that the one? Where, where, uh, where does thinking come from? Where does it originate? It is between our two ears. It is the grey matter uh, between our ears. It is, you say it's the brain. Okay, let's, let's use the word mind. The body, the soul, the spirit, the mind. This is the mind. So it is the mind that does the thinking. So, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, and so on. These are the things, verse 20, which defile a man. So we look at Proverbs 20, verse 23, verse 7. So you have a, another uh, verse that sh gives you a hint of where is this heart. Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For as he thinks in his heart, so do you think with your heart? No, we don't. We think with our mind. So as he thinks in his mind, as he thinks in his heart, so in this, in the usage of the heart in the Bible, even here as we are studying, it is not referring to the organ on the left side of your breast, which is beating every second. This refers to the mind. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We look at one more. Um, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 9 verse 4. Matthew chapter 9 verse 4. And this is from none other than our Lord Jesus. Uh, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, knowing their thoughts, that means thinking. Why, he said, why do you think evil in your hearts? You mean, Jesus did not know the location of the organ, the heart organ? Yes, but he wasn't referring to that. Why do you think in your mind? Why do you think evil in your hearts? So, what I'm trying to bring to you is, even as we read this, even as we read this, understand, the heart here is not referring to the physical organ on the left side of our breast, but this is the mind. For out of the mind proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, and the rest. So, it would do us good to pray for a washed heart rather than washed hands. It would do us good to bear in mind internal intimacy is far better than external religiosity because out of the heart, out of the mind, comes all this evil thing. But they can also come forth. Good things. Good things. So before we leave this, let's look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Because some people in this uh, world, they, they, they mix things around. And God said in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness 
who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Let's not do it the reverse. Let's put to good use what God had intended it to be. So he gave us a mind and he gave us wisdom. Let's put all this to good use for his glory. So I just read the last part. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. These are just external rituals, which for hygienic reason it is good, but not, not to do so uh, as religiosity. So let's look now. We finished the first part, which is um, what defiles a man. Now as we come to the second part, this is the ministry among the Gentiles. So Jesus left this place uh, in verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So let's look at the map and see where exactly is this place. If you follow me, Last week he was when we finished the lesson he was in Bethsaida. They met then together with the disciples. They made their way to Gennesaret, and we started this chapter with the scribes and Pharisees coming up from Jerusalem to meet him here. And when he had done this, done the ministry, and when he had taught the the disciples on the on the defilement topic. Verse 21, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And where are these two? They are located on the west coast of Israel. And these are coastal towns. But at that point in time, at that point in time, this is not part of Israel. These are located, these were located outside Israel. So that is the first time on record that Jesus had left Israel. And he just got away from Israel. He wanted to go away to this coast, to the Gentiles, to take a rest. We find this, we find this in Mark chapter 7, verse 24. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, looking at the screen, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. He did not want anyone to know about it because he wanted a break, he wanted a rest because he's been working uh, tirelessly, uh, continuously, and now he wants to take a break. So, when he was there, behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region. Now, these places of Tyre and Sidon, these are, as I mentioned earlier, these are Gentile areas, and uh, they are not exactly uh, God worshippers, they are idol worshippers, and, and being coastal towns, coastal ports, um, uh, they have import of culture and and of course, come with that uh, uh, immorality and other things and the likes uh, in this area. But Jesus went. So it is an indication, it is a, a point, I mean it's pointing to us that Jesus does include the Gentiles in his grand plan of redemption. We shall see. So first, we look at this woman, verse 22. So Tyre and Sidon today, they are in the region of uh, Lebanon, as we know in our modern map. And in verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him. She had a daughter, and the daughter was demon-possessed. Now it doesn't, I mean, um, 
it may be demon possessed the, the your, your child may be sick unwell or whatever but you know that the compassion of a mother and the, the heart of a mother would yearn for 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 the restoration of her child and she was so burdened uh, for her child that she came to Jesus now socially um, there are two things which are not in her favor first of all she was a woman and the status of a woman in the society is not exactly very high and women can be con considered even as an item, an object to be possessed or dispossessed. But this woman was in distress, so she needed help and she came to Jesus. So the first thing against her was she was a woman. And the second thing that is not in her favor was she was a Canaanite, a Gentile. And, you know, um, the, the Jews will keep themselves apart from the Gentiles. They consider the Gentiles unclean and they are ostracized. And it is like currently we have got this uh, discrimination, whatever happened in the States in the last couple of weeks, you know, uh, George, George Floyd was killed and, and now they have this uh, campaign, Black Lives Matter. Well, back to this, there was discrimination against a woman and there was discrimination against Gentiles. Anyway, this woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him. And she said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, we can just read this and go on to the next verse, but this verse reveals quite a bit about this woman. She was a Gentile. We do not know for sure if she has given her heart to Jesus, she's a follower, a believer of Jesus or not, we don't know. But probably like the rest of the multitudes who followed Jesus around, she must have heard from others that this man is a holy man. He is a miracle worker and he can heal, he can deliver this the, 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 he can heal the sick, deliver the, the possessed. And what is most revealing is when she came to Jesus, she uh, uttered something. Her, her call, her description, her acknowledgement of this person is different. Even the Pharisees do not do it. Even Jews do not do it. Not all. And she said, O oh Lord, son of David. You know, Lord son of David, this is very messianic. That means she acknowledged and she recognized that this person before her is the promise of God the Father to David that through his line, there will be one. Through the line of David, there will be one who will rule and reign the world. He will come and he will be the king of kings and so she said O Lord son of David pointing to the Messiah and the, 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 the ironical thing is she is a Gentile and she knew of the Messiah and she called upon him but the Pharisees who knew the scriptures need, did not address him nor acknowledge Jesus as the son of David Nonetheless, this woman approached Jesus in faith, trusting that he can heal. He can heal even from a distance as she approached him. So she said, she brought straight, she brought to Jesus the problem. My daughter is severely demon possessed. Now, do you know she got no claim? Being a Gentile, she got no claim on Jesus, especially not claiming that he is the son of David. She is outside the family of Jews. She got no claim. And what right has she got to bring her problem even to Jesus? 
And so she was following behind Jesus and his entourage. And in verse 23, But he answered her not a word. And he answered her not a word. You and I are very sure Jesus heard, heard her cry. Because the word there, cry, it is not a murmur, it is not a whisper, it is really a loud cry. A loud volume. Surely Jesus heard. But he answered her not a word. Now, it is a very familiar experience for many of us. And sometimes when we pray, whether it is a health issue or financial issue or relationship issue or whatever, then we find that God is silent. When God is silent, we get a bit anxious. And so, we, we, we get uh, not just anxious, we, we, we get a bit desperate and then we try so many other avenues and, and, and so on. But there are occasions when God is silent. And His silence upon us is to teach us something. And in this case, He was trying to draw out the faith of this woman. And other occasions, I'm sure it will apply to us even when we bring our problems to Him and we, 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 we petition and then we find that He is silent. Recognize that he is also testing our faith that we may mature. So, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. And his disciples who came around, like his bodyguards, and they asked Jesus, urged him, Send her away, for she cries out after us. She's making too much of a scene, too much noise, too many people will come after us. So, send her away. Now, when we read it in the English language, it seems like, just get rid of her. But that is not exactly the meaning in the original text in Greek. The, the word there is, send her away satisfied. That means, what the disciples were saying to Jesus was, give her what she wants and quickly send her away. Jesus could have just done that. Okay, your daughter is healed. And then, what else? Nothing. Then she will go away and problem is over, issue is over. There will be no scene. It is just a quiet deliverance. The daughter is set free. Okay, bye-bye, you know. But not Jesus. He wasn't just going to give her what she wants and send her away satisfied. Verse 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lordship of the house of Israel. Now, in verse 24, he was not addressing the woman. He was teaching. He was addressing the disciples because the disciples said, came to him and told Jesus, you know, this woman behind her, just do what she needs. No, give her what she wants and then send her away. But Jesus answered his disciples and said, I was not sent except to the lordship of the house of Israel. We all know by now, without any further reminder, that Jesus came to his own and they received him not. This is found in John chapter 1, verse 11. Jesus, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So he came to his own. But Jesus is also Jesus for the world. But first, first, even as he taught his disciples, first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. First to the Jews. So if you want to see this in full, then we should look at, let me see, uh, um, in verse, let me look at Mark chapter 7. Uh, 
Okay, this I will explain later. Mark chapter 7, verse 27. Let the children, the children of Israel, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. I'll explain shortly. But what Jesus was saying is, I came. I came to the house of Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and then later for the world. So first the Jews. So he answered in verse 24. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him. So you imagine this entourage, Jesus and his disciples were moving ahead. And then there is this woman behind crying. And then the disciples told Jesus, send her away. And Jesus turned around, answered them, I was not sent to, the, to anyone else but the lordship of Israel. And meanwhile, in verse 25, then she came, she caught up and she came to Jesus. And you know what she did? She worshipped him. She worshipped him. She came and worshipped him. Has she been to Bible school? Has she been saved? Has anyone taught her? No, but this is just out of the heart of a desperate mother yearning for the well-being and the restoration and the deliverance of her daughter. And she persisted. She was not discouraged. I mean, look at the, the Jesus and his people. They were just not stopping for her. They were not turning around and coming to her. She wasn't discouraged and she persisted and she came uh, and worshipped him. So even in the silence, as we studied just now, the, uh, 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 when God is silent, so even in the silence, she pressed on, she pressed in and said, what did she say? Lord, help me. Then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. And by now we know, desperate prayers are short prayers. Because last week when we studied Peter drowning in the Sea of Galilee, he too uttered a very short prayer. Three words, Lord, save me. Now this woman here says, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. It is not good, it is not right to take the children's bread. The, the, what Jesus was saying, the promises, the promises to the Jews and throw it to the little dogs. Now, if you read this, it seems like quite harsh. So that's why we should look at Mark 7 verse 27, which I have it on the screen earlier. Read this, even as Mark uh, recorded the complete uh, words there for us. Let, it's not that Jesus, as what he said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. But you must read the, the full sentence which is here. Let the children be filled first. Who are these children? In the context, it refers to the Jews. It refers to the children of God. Let the Jews be filled first. Let the promises to the Jews be done, be fulfilled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, um, dogs uh, are not exactly well treated or, 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 or looked at looked upon in the Jewish context because Gentiles like us, we are described as dogs. But in this word, the little dogs in the Greek, it is kunia, K-U-N-I-A. And these are pet dogs, pet dogs, domestic dogs. These are not scavengers. These are not dogs which run around in the street. These are, are pet dogs, domestic so, referring to the Gentiles. That's what Jesus was using. He wasn't using the scavenger dog, but he was using the pet dogs. And Jesus said this to her. It's not that he wanted to reject her. 
it is just that he wanted to draw out the faith in her. Because if she had just come and then said, uh, my daughter is demon-possessed, uh, Lord, son of uh, David, my daughter is demon-possessed. And then Jesus said, okay, she's healed. What has she learned? What has she learned? Except that her daughter was healed, but what has she learned? How has she grown even in this experience? So Jesus is taking this time to teach her and to draw out the faith that is in her. And verse 27, and she persisted. You know, this whatever obstacles uh, that was before her did not silence her faith. She pressed in and she said with humility. And she said, yes, Lord. Even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Even the little dogs, the domestic ones at, at home, they will just eat off, not off the table, but whatever drops from the table and falls from the master's table, they will eat it. So it, it shows a person like her, a woman, of faith and determination, not one who gave up easily. So there is this thing called persistence. And it teaches us something that we should continue to ask, that we should continue to say, and continue to knock, that it will be open for us. So verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, as I mentioned before, this term, O woman, is not a term of, uh, of rudeness. It is not impolite. It is a term of endearment used even for the lady before him. O woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. And this Jesus had ascribed, I mean, had said to her, I mean, commanded her, though she had never been with Jesus before, but by her plea and her cry and her determination, all this demonstrate her faith. And so Jesus said, let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And he tells us one thing. Jesus will not cast away anyone who comes to him. And if you come to our Lord Jesus, he will not turn you away. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Wonderful. How wonderful it is. And so just uh, two, three more verses in this section. So verse 29 Jesus departed from there, from where? From Tyre and Sidon. So looking at the map, so Jesus, after he has been there, he departed from Tyre and Sidon. And where did he go? He departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee. This is the Sea of Galilee. And went up on the mountain and sat down there. Now, we don't get a full picture or where he went. Let's look at uh, Mark again, at Mark chapter 7 and verse 31. Same event, again departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. So just now we read, he departed from Tyre and Sidon, skirted, that means he went around the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain. But here it tells us that he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. So back to the map. Back to the map. So our Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus went all the way down skirted the Sea of Galilee and came to this area, the Decapolis, Decap, Decap, ten, 10 cities or 10 villages. 
it is here and this area is mostly Gentile area so he came from up there all the way down to Decapolis a Gentile area so verse 30 then great multitudes Gentiles then great multitudes came to him having with them the lame blind mute maimed and many others and they laid them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them and he healed them and he did not heal some he healed all he healed them these are the multitudes of Gentiles do they know him? don't think so but they must have heard of his uh, miraculous working powers and so they came and he healed them and all this we all know it, sh it is the evidence of the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ so the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking the maimed made whole the lame walking and the blind seeing and they glorified the God of Israel they saw all these wonderful works of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blind saw, the lame walk, the seed healed, the demon possessed, delivered. Wonderful! And who did they ascribe praises to? To God of Israel. And by the fact that they glorified, it is written, they glorified the God of Israel. It means these are the Gentiles. They glorified the God of Israel. If it is written that way, it is referring to the Gentiles glorifying the God of Israel. If not, it would have been as simply as they glorified God. So, what a contrast. The Pharisees and the scribes, they are the Jews and they got the scriptures, they got the truth, but they got no understanding. And they are prideful, they have their own agenda. And despite, of, despite all this that Jesus had done, even when he was in Israel, healing the sick and, and, and teaching them and, and, and all these miracles, they were still after his life. They did not give glory to God. But here in the Gentile land, for all that he done, for all that he did, he received or God received a different response. They glorified him. So we pause here and when we come back, we'll finish the remaining part of chapter 15.